So a good uh, headline for introducing our conversation today is uh, too many corporate innovation fail. Because there is one problem uh, that uh, most of the corporate venturing programs uh, produce uh, little results. On the one hand, uh, this uh, topic might create some uh, uh, worrisome. On the other hand, uh, is uh, is a big opportunity, and this is the norm, and it's important to understand why is that. In order to do so and to to deal with this big uh, topic, I'm happy to have with me today uh, Uwe Kirschner, that is partner and a VP of Bosch Management Consulting. Hi, Uwe. Hi there. And on the other end, I have also from Singapore Michael Nichols. That is the F of Bosch Management Consulting for Asian Pacific. Hi, Michael. Hello. Thanks for having me. So, guys, uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, there is a lot of learning uh, from uh, your experience. And so before getting started, um, have been, I think, maybe beneficial to understand a bit uh, what is Bosch uh, Accelerator program and what is Bosch Management Consulting? So I guess I'll, I'll start that. Bosch, you have to start with the one to get to the other, what, what Bosch Accelerator program is. Bosch Accelerator, the Bosch Management Consulting originally began as a corporate department, a central department called Corporate Business Model Innovation, which if you know much about innovation, that can seem like an oxymoron, right? Because what does a what does a corporate department have at all to do with innovation? But when you look at Bosch and you look at the ambitions of our company, for, for most of our history, we've been a hardcore hardware company in a tier one position, delivering components uh, to OEMs um, to deliver to the end consumer. But we, our leadership has recognized we want to go beyond that and that actually business model innovation can, can drive um, new value out of an existing ecosystem, or if you even want to go beyond it to serve new customer segments with your existing capabilities. And that's the origin of our department, Corporate Business Model Innovation. Uva was one of the founding partners there, so he can add comments to that. Then how we got to the Bosch Accelerator program was when we began thinking about business model innovation, we, we very much approached it from a networking standpoint and trying to learn from a theory perspective, what is it? And I remember very clearly with Uva when the department began, where we started doing trainings and consulting, we both t told each other often, hey, we, we got to learn how to do this in practice, right? One, to build credibility. The other is just to learn how in a corporate context you can run quick experiments beyond your core business. And maybe Uva, you want to take it from there um, with how, we, how exactly we ended up creating the Bosch Accelerator program and what it is. Yeah, from day onwards, it was clear that the validation of an respective innovation project is quite important. That's, you know, in the inner, it, it's, it's really driving success uh, of all your innovation activities. And we started uh, by consulting the first innovation project and the second, the third, or the fourth. And we saw, uh, well, you know, this is also not really a, a scaling a business. You can't hire more and more consultants. Uh, for uh, just for just one uh, individual innovation projects and um, knowing the success rates out there in the in the real world and uh, also uh, getting to know even more uh, the methodologies which already existed back then we knew that we really had to find an efficient way 
to validate many, many innovation ideas uh, for Bosch. And uh, this is a very big topic because, again, uh, the original goal, if I got it right, but please uh, fix me if I'm saying something wrong, is was to try to help uh, some uh, internally generated ideas, project to eventually scale up up to the end. And so that was the original goal. And obviously, a, a corporate large as Bosch, like most of the incumbent in the world, uh, potentially might be dealing with hundreds or thousands of ideas. And obviously, supporting them individually is almost um, an impractical um, proposition. And on the other hand, uh, there is the evidence that are coming from the world of startups. I think we can uh, we can use some some data here from uh, for example cb insights that show us which are the the failure rates from the world of startups and so again if we look at what is happening in the startup world i don't know if michael Uber, you want to comment is probably uh, something that uh, is telling that uh, obviously we cannot deal with 1000 program actually you have to deal with 1000 program if you want to get something but on, this, on the other end, it's almost impossible to nurture their individual. Yeah, what we always say, you have to allow uh, to fail, that you know, we, we will see eventually uh, winners uh, which will really succeed. So you, you need to have many, many ideas. And also looking uh, at this uh, CP Insider, which is totally in line to our own findings, uh, which we've gathered internally, uh, many, many um, innovation projects fail because the intended value proposition is not strong enough to generate out of that a relevant business for a corporation uh, like, like Bosch. And, um, and since we concentrate on adjacent and beyond, not uh, next generation innovation activities, uh, it is quite important to, to find out whether your or our ideas can scale in a meaningful uh, way. And thanks to our uh, program, as we know, there is a, a there is an efficient way to do so before investing lots of money. And that's that's the trick. And I think this is quite still unusual. That's our perception for many, many corporate innovations that you can do already a lot without pre-investing in product and technology development. And I think just to add a little bit onto the context of what Uva is saying is that in a major corporate, particularly corporates that are heavily engineering focused, they're not exactly familiar with that math, right? And they're not they're they're used to producing in an environment where you know the customer, where there's a relatively high probability that your next generation that you've iterated upon will hit success. The reasoning being that you know your value networks, you know the value chains. You know your customers, you know the value uh, propositions, and your capabilities have been shaped to deliver to that. But when you venture beyond, as Uwe was saying, then the probability starts to drop very quickly and precipitously that you will fail once you go beyond that. And the reason being is that you don't understand that market need. And it wasn't us, it wasn't on us to say, let's just deny that reality. We we would rather accept that the math is the math. And if you accept the math, then that tells you certain things about how you need to work. And as you said, Alberto, yeah, that implies that you actually need to be testing around a thousand ideas um, to have a chance at these winners emerging. And we knew that. Um, and, and Uva, maybe you'll tell him about how we went out to partner with uh, University of California, Berkeley originally when we started the program, because they had the same understanding of that math. They weren't selling selling us a unicorn or pies in the sky they were selling us the truth so maybe you want to comment on that, Uwe, yeah, how that started happened. Started back then so also we in our corporation we are not shy uh, to cooperate with those who are best known who are experts uh, world-class experts in their respective fields and we would still conclude uh, looking at all innovation initiatives all academics around the, the globe so Berkeley uh, and Stanford uh, most probably uh, are still uh, very good uh, institutes and they are you know, professors, they are very experienced people who know um, how to run innovation uh, projects, how to validate innovation projects uh, at scale. And that's the reason why we reached out to them 
and uh, that's why we are still cooperating with them because this this constant uh, also additional um, input we get from from external it's beneficial to further improve um, uh, our program yes let me just uh, to stop you here just this is uh, some data coming from change logic and uh, let's show uh, a reality that uh, not just uh, uh, a few startups make to the top or make to to turn into a unicorn but we are talking about something that is an handful out of thousands but also the corporate innovation do fail as well and this is some some data from different sources that are uh singing the same tune and the tune is that we're talking about a small percentage of projects that are coming to the end not to yeah. mention that just a few of them then will be that make a very dent on, on the company because on the other end we need to to recognize that large corporation in order to do something that is uh, uh significant they have to move in uh, something that is uh, talking about hundreds of millions or billions in order to becoming something that is really valuable, right? The small things, technically speaking, are, do not right. matter. And so the problem that we see as, uh, as working with many large corporates on top of innovation is that uh, these data most of the time are kept hidden because uh, if you go in the corporate world with such a potential proposition the first thing that you will get from the top is no thank you or nine as since we're talking about germany because again <laughs> it's something that uh, scare and the corporate world by by definition is a world that is used not to have uh, not to cope with failure failure is something that is that's not a word that is really particularly accepted inside so can you help us to understand also how you are able to to unveil the, the reality and uh, to turn this from uh, a potential weakness in the traditional copper war into a potential success factor. So first of all, I would argue um, from the from day one onwards. So when we started the first uh, program uh, around uh, some some years ago, from the very first moment, we said it's about generating doing real business. It's about really generating um, explore adjacent uh, opportunities uh, for our company so our ambitions go beyond some training activities some activation activities just working and supporting uh, associates uh, to be inspired or, or, or drive uh, the purpose this is also don't get me wrong this is also very yep. important but at the end of the day it's about delivering real business uh, results and, and then uh, one way to um, to also um, accept or that also the senior management accepts uh, this this failure rate uh, is uh, to uh, first of all honestly talk about what can be expected in, in in such a program if we're really honest to ourselves and and second what are the relevant criteria we also have developed and iterated uh, over time which actually actually explain this anyhow in an, in an organization um, I would argue with some maybe a few exceptions around the world an organization is not able to incubate hundreds of innovation ideas so it's actually also a, a quite efficient filter to really identify again very early in the process those very few innovation projects which have potential uh, uh, to scale right because at, at the end of the day the, the, the value proposition for them you can look at it one over two ways right so if you don't understand that these are the failure rates you you are likely to invest too much too early and set up a very fat organization around it and create these things i know Uwe and i like to call them dead horses um and the problem with that is if you think about the math and you think about the probability of success you're tying up way too much capital and cash on an idea that's likely to fail so the value proposition of telling them hey the reality is this is that now they understand, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't be investing so much so early. I can test in pieces, looking at the criteria, the typical progress of, or maturity of a, of a project as it goes out and explores the data with the customers, with the value propositions, and as it builds up uh, prototypes, et cetera. That's one of the value propositions. The second value proposition is to look at the upside. How much is it worth to you to, to test whether your strategy is a good one and to test it cheaply and much faster than you would in a traditional product development process. 
So you flip that math and actually you can turn it into a value proposition so we can create a much more efficient and capital efficient innovation program that helps you test your strategy and has these tangential effects of, as Uwe mentioned, um, cultural effects that people learn to say, well, actually failure is just a part of the game. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Yes, and, and going straight to this point that is, I think is, is relevant is uh, you are mentioning one of the problem is to investing too early capital and obviously this capital most of the time do not return. But the problem mm -hmm. that we see is that inventing time and resources and expectation of your own people to work on something that uh, it just uh, became uh, an educational exercise. And don't take me wrong, I believe that the educational exercise is powerful, and that's something that is strongly recommended, but it's powerful assuming that expectation are properly set since the beginning. Because again, if you create the expectation that all of the submitted ideas into an entrepreneurship program uh, initiative will come to the end, since most of them won't, all of them that they submitted with such an expectation will turn into frustrated people that start with a lot of enthusiasm and on the other hand, have most of the time of frustration. If I may interject, I, I think that's a false binary that people have constructed, right? That you're either learning or doing innovation, theater and culture, or you're doing business, but you can't do both. But the reality is completely different. You, you can and should do both, right? So by going through an intense experience like, like the Accelerator program, you see it in sports, you see it in music, see it through any sort of activity where people go through intense thing together, they actually bond, they create a culture there. And the same thing happens in the Accelerator program that people change, they develop a strong culture around this failure rate, right? And saying, it's okay to fail, it's okay. It's actually expected that you're gonna fail. That's the most likely thing. Um, so it's a false binary at the end of the day that it's either learn or culture or it's business. It actually should and is both. It should be and is both. No, it should. Yeah, please. No, I say should be both if you communicate it properly. But if properly, you do correct, not, yeah. is none of them. That's yeah. that's the, yeah. the binary because again, most of, yeah. I, we see that most of the organization are created monsters. Yeah. populating with false expectations and at yeah. the end uh, when you create a monster it's difficult to just to uh to, to pretend it does not exist the monster is there and the, every year that you run the process the, the worse it comes but if you properly set it up with the proper expectation at the end you can get them both you are educating Correct. people Correct. and be able to nurture the best so that yeah. is was my yeah yeah, and the monster maybe is also partly because it's, it's, it comes from the, from the core business, right? So, um, so normally, if you start a new next generation uh, product development in your existing core, of course, the expectation is uh, if the market is not disrupted, yeah, which is, as we know, is happening more and more. Mm -hmm. but anyhow, the expectation is that you will be uh, eventually successful with this next generation uh, innovation uh, project. And... Um, and as you say, what you need to make sure is when you are testing your 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 updated strategy, which goes um, beyond the specific or the, the existing core, you need to have numerous ideas addressing your strategic uh, topic or topics. Uh, and this you need to do. I still have seen organizations that they have like a new strategic topic, and then they start one innovation project around this new strategic mm. topic. I would say that's totally wrong. Yeah. There you need to, you can only allow to be successful in this uh, in this new field. You only can expect that if you have numerous ideas addresses, addressing this new strategic term. Um, and, and something that's underestimated, I think, uh, on top of that core business are KPIs. And people have sort of understood that HR rewards them for never failing. Right? Even, yeah. even all of our interviews are set up as the star stories, right? Every star story... I was personally involved on in and we won. It's never tell me your dog days, right? Tell me the time, all the times you failed. You're not necessarily rewarded for that. So I think this bravado, right? And this sort of intellectual arrogance comes from a lot of cases, the KPIs that are set. It's nothing personal with the people in the in the core business. It's just that 
That's the culture that's been established. Those are the KPIs that have been established. And that's where that behavior follows from. Yes, correct. So I think it might be interesting to go through the structure of the Bosch Accelerator program to see how it's structured, how many batches. If I got it right, you started the first batches in 2017, correct. and you are about to announce the 11 batch. So substantially, it's been a quite long history for a short program. And so maybe you can give us um, uh, the perspective of how it works. Yeah, as I said, we already uh, back in 2017 started with our uh, first uh, batch uh, in cooperation with our uh, partners from from Berkeley, and uh, already in in batch one we collected uh, 24 innovation uh, projects, and uh, they went through um, phase one of the accelerator uh, program, and what really still astonishes me is the fact that in a very, very short period of time, and uh, the typical duration of our phase one is just uh, eight weeks, that we can already identify numerous innovation uh, projects without even having the first MVP, minimal viable product at all, we are able to already terminate uh, numerous innovation projects. Uh, on average, um, 70 to 80% um, of all innovation projects already end um, after uh, phase one. And again, this is based on thoroughly developed and iterated uh, KPIs. And, and maybe the reasoning why that happens is exactly matches with the data you showed earlier that they're unable simply in those first eight weeks to, to find a fundamental customer problem that's not just strong enough, but but also relevant for a company of our size, right? Do enough people have this problem or do the customers that have them, is it big enough that it could justify an investment in the technology? Then in phase two, to, to build on your on your question, in phase two, that phase indeed is, is longer, um, typically five uh, to six months. Only so phase two, one is longer? Oh. Two months and uh, oh. phase two, uh, five to six months. Okay. Yeah, and only in phase two, uh, we start with the first version of the so-called uh, minimal viable product and we are uh, increasing the maturity through iterations and customer feedback uh, in phase two of the program and uh, the colleagues are also uh, are tasked to uh, validate all hypoth hypotheses uh, around uh, the, the business model beyond the physical or, or visual representation um, of their uh, value proposition. The question, Uwe, this is quite relevant, uh, is uh, the ideas are submitted from your employees from the different uh, business lines. Uh, how much time uh, they are, the possibility to work on the project in the different phases? Do you allocate them time? Is work on, uh, on a, um, just based on their free time? How does it work? Because it's quite a... That's a, very important, that's a very relevant question, I bet you are, you are asking here. <laughs> and yeah. um, I always say uh, the next product generation uh, development, we shall, and we do not start on a Friday uh, afternoon. Uh, 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 obviously, we are starting on Monday morning. And uh, guess what? The same is true also for adjacent and explore activities. You should, you must start on, on a Monday morning. Uh, and that's why I, I would say um, we are quite right to uh, argue it is a prerequisite to join uh, our program um, um, if uh, the innovation team, if the dear leader is, is, is capable in providing not only an interesting idea, but also, for example, the willingness, the ability to have a team at hand. We are asking typically for uh, three to four uh, associates uh, a minimum working 50% of their time uh, during phase one and 100% uh, during uh, phase two because in part time you won't be successful uh, in innovating. Uh, uh, Michael always says um, if you are not able to bring the, the necessary capacities on your innovation projects, well, probably you're not right or you're not serious in, in really driving innovation in your yeah. respective uh, area of responsibility. Totally, and it's this, it's this crazy expectation that I can create a unicorn without investing anything. Right? Like, how do you expect that to actually work in the real world? Uh, to produce a unicorn with one billion in revenue, you better be prepared 
to use American English, to pony up around a billion, <laughs> around a billion dollars, right? If you're really serious about it. But it what's funny about it, and this is why this is a good test of whether it's lip service from a company or not, is to say, okay, give me your employees full time, right? Give me four of them, give them time, capacity, resources, anything they need. If you're not willing to do that, you're not serious about innovation, period. Right? No, <laughs> I, I'm totally with you guys, but this, the major objection that we get uh, discussing entrepreneurship program venture builder is uh, the time that people can really allocate to the project. And I say, okay, let's do half a day a month, or one day a week in the final phases. And that tell you a lot, uh, because again, yeah. <laughs> you know, if in the startup world, you will never yeah. put a dollar on a part-time entrepreneur, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know why in the corporate world that should should, should happen, uh, because they cannot uh, resolve the trade-off between the day-by-day -day activities and the future. And that's, exactly. That's and, uh, but your question is, or your comment is so right, and because the people are tasked to concentrate on their daily routines, on their on their job, and what we've also seen in many, many organizations out there. And then it is just expected that this development of adjacent and new uh, businesses just happens, I don't know, overnight during the weekend. <laughs> at a certain point, these new wonderful innovation projects, right? They are, they are there. And uh, there we, we have to be uh, honest. And by the way, I believe that's also one of the major reasons why so many corporates are struggling in that area, yeah? Because they're not really serious. If you want to drive innovation beyond your existing core, well, make people, guess what? Make people <laughs> responsible for that, yeah? And with that, you're touching clearly upon our one yeah. of our most favorite uh, topics of, of organizational and dexterity. Correct, correct. I was about to jump on that, right? That you can't just <laughs> yes. expect innovation beyond the core to, as Americans say, automagically happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> it, well, I think it comes from that exactly what Uva just said, organizational ambidexterity. That is a key thing to, to recognize. If you don't recognize that you're operating outside of your core, then you will treat the business as if it's the core. And in the core, you can do this. You can play this game of cost cutting uh, because the business is relatively secure. But when you're doing that with a brand new business, you're nowhere near that stage yet. So it comes from a fun fundamental misapprehension of the context you're even in that you think, well, okay, I'm going to put my core people on these topics over here, as Uva said, for like 30 minutes on a Friday. Come on, that's a, that's a joke at the, at the end of the day. That you can't expect that to work. Uh, unfortunately, it's, might, not, it it's, might, not, it it's not a joke. <laughs> unfortunately, it's not a joke. And that's exactly what happens across the board. Uh, let's call it uh, Oktoberfest uh, innovation. Again. <laughs> well, the, the innovation theater, right? Exactly. That is again. If you you expect that people, since startups are out of the box uh, as a mentality, they also be out of the working hours in terms of um, effort. And at the end, uh, it doesn't work. And, uh, to go back to your point, though, Alberto, this. I think people spend they spend money on this innovation theater and they think that motivates people. But if you think through it, past the the event with everybody with their coffee cups and a jury, what actually ends up happening is these people will become thoroughly demoralized because they'll realize this was all BS, right? You were not really committed to see my project go through to the end, right? And those people will leave the company. And this goes back to one of our points when we met uh, Henry Chesbro is there's this idea that the IP won't leave the company. Well, it's going to leave. It's going to leave through those people that you just demoralized, right? They're going to go out and try that on the market. And guess what? They might make a few million, which is enough for them, but it's not enough for your company, right? So this is, they haven't even thought, I would think, I would say they haven't really thought through the implications of the innovation theater. It actually does not help your culture. I think it does the opposite, makes it worse in the end. Yeah, what I was referring at the beginning when we talk about frustration as that frustration mm -hmm. is the, the money that you get uh, if you don't properly set up the expectation and you don't allocate the right resources to, to make things happen. Because after this uh, honeymoon effect, when everybody's happy and say excited, and you see that at the end, again, if you don't invest properly, if you don't have quality resources, quality time, and the adequate budget at the end, you will get nothing out of that. And then also, when you expose your nothing to the top management, there will be 
a double uh, edge sword eating you because at the end they will see that what you've been producing is not valuable of your time and people start delegating to the junior to the junior to the junior to participate in these activities and nobody will do anything so that's is uh, is part of the concern but the fact that you are allocating uh, full-time people for the phase two uh, phase two how many project typically talking about uh, what is the typical number of projects uh, that you typically have. deal <laughs> yeah, yeah have always exactly. Yeah, exactly so as i said 70 80 percent already leave after uh, after phase one so we have like um, typically around 10 or even a couple of projects less than 10 projects in phase uh, phase two uh, and um, already, uh, not only because of the pandemic, already uh, before that it became clear that uh, we also moved away from what we called uh, this pure uh, batch format, meaning that we always collect uh, a, yeah. a higher number of innovation projects. Now, uh, uh, theoretically, uh, every day one innovation project uh, can join uh, our program. And there's also, also no fixed quota behind. So if an innovation teams team uh, uh, qualifies for phase two and also qualifies then later for the incubation uh, process, they clearly get a, a, a go. So it's really solely driven uh, on, 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 on objective criteria and, and not on personal perception uh, or beliefs. Or yeah. gut feeling, yeah. <laughs> it's even yeah. worse, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so phase one is two months, uh, 70, 80 percent do leave mm -hmm. phase two is five six months the goal mm -hmm. is to produce an mvp and we're talking about approximately 10 projects per year something like that and of many of them pass through the four gate that is brings to what you call uh, i think uh, incubation we call it incubation phase exactly so again 70 to 80 percent uh, fail uh, or I should rather say, don't proceed, yeah, or are successfully yeah. terminated, as we even say here internally. Successfully, yeah, successfully terminated. Let terminated. me write it down yeah. because this is beautiful. Yeah, and uh, the rest. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's self-declared, by the way. We didn't mention that. that yeah, we have mentioned that exactly. Yeah. We we don't kill the projects ourselves. Yeah. That because of the criteria that we've developed and we've made them quite transparent, we expect the teams and their investors to self-declare go or no go, and the vast majority of the cases. The teams themselves say we don't have sufficient evidence to justify going forward. Also, because they are investing their personal time and resources Correct. to, and so Correct. that is a powerful incentive also to decide that uh, free beer after a while <laughs> it ends, right? Well, there's no free beer. <laughs> exactly. No, and, and, and I think Uva would say the same thing as who wants to work on a loser? Nobody does. So if you just provide the right cre criteria for them to detect a loser, very early, then they're very willing to jump off. Yeah, and we also did service around that. So you could expect, uh, Alberto, lo looking at, the, at these failure or success rates, you could argue or expect, oh, maybe uh, you've left uh, uh, quite numerous uh, associates behind um, who somehow left the program with a sort of discomfort or some bad feelings. I actually have to say, or we can conclude, the opposite is true. And why? Uh, I believe it's because it's the rhythm, it's the spirit of the program, which is clear from minute one uh, onwards. Second, I would say it's a clear, uh, uh, as we already highlighted, a, a clear work uh, around the, the so-called GO criteria, so having the right uh, KPIs. And it's also around that uh, the associates declare by themselves uh, a, a no-go, uh, uh, because we ask the necessary questions to exactly answer um, uh, or come to the conclusion whether this idea has potential to scale uh, or not. And uh, nobody wants to work. This is the, the, the more younger people I also meet in organizations, the more I have the impression that uh, working on a real purpose, um, working on something which really makes sense, not only for the company, but also for the, for the associates, for the people themselves, is becoming more and more important. And with that in mind, people leave the program quite satisfied and we have a recommendation rate on average per batch of 99 percent that's that's very cool can we take a look at the the results i think is uh, the history of your 11 batches if i got it right thus far and i think it is there is a lot of telling looking at this number and uh, may i ask you to comment 
So yeah, so first of all, it's, uh, these are the numbers uh, for batch one to 10. Uh, batch 11, we're gonna start very soon. Yes. And, and batch 10 is still running. So we have to wait for the final results. Uh, Correct. Batch, uh, batch 10. But again, as you can see, uh, uh, more than 200 innovation projects uh, entered the, the Bosch Accelerator program. And uh, uh, until today, uh, 19 have exited it uh, with a go decision for the upcoming incubation phase. What's also very interesting, what we also learned over time, that uh, still even those 19 innovation projects uh, uh, may not be finally successful uh, in the respective yeah. markets. That's why we say the, the accelerator program offers a so-called initial successful validation of the respe respective venture. And uh, we've seen uh, innovation projects uh, also which got stopped after, uh, after the successful validation maybe because um, of a strategic move, uh, maybe uh, because of um, that the, the internet growth uh, could not be uh, shown, and a couple of reasons more. So it shows again um, that um, you have to uh, run many, many innovation projects to identify those very few which are really successful and uh, again, you need to have a very efficient process, a cost-efficient process, a fast and cost-efficient process uh, to, to get through. Yes, because again, uh, if I'm uh, good at doing math, 19 out of 800 is 2%, and out of these 19, probably a few of them will be really successful. So we're talking about something that is about 1%. Uh, so, Uwe, if I can do the math, uh, it looks like that... Uh, 19 out of 800, we're talking about something that is about 2%, and probably out of these 19, uh, just uh, a small percentage will be really successful. So this number, 1% something, is something that might be scary from a corporate perspective. But on the other end, uh, if it works, and we are able to create a uh, hundred of million or billion new businesses, totally uh good to go and so that is i think is the, the main uh, point to to go beyond the innovation theater and to really uh enter in the area when you can really produce results so uh, okay. yeah so it, it underlines again alberto that an organization needs to have a fast and a very cost efficient innovation uh, process and um as i said uh, roughly some 200 innovation projects entered our accelerator program and the vast majority can already stopped can be stopped after a very short period of time and an organization then can again concentrate on the remaining uh, projects with more potential and um, that's quite important and uh, it's a numbers game we are we are a believer of that uh, of, of, you know, of this numbers game we believe you need to have high, a high number of innovation projects to find that very few which are really successful. And yes, uh, and, and a successful innovation needs to have many, many ideas to have one or the other to really succeed. I would, I would probably be even more radical or extreme on this. I think it's worth running the funnel even if you never find the 1%. Why? Because in our case, you're running those projects anyway. The probability is the probability so you better do it faster and more efficiently, right? So the probability of success is the same whether you're in the program or not, except that in our program, you find that out much faster. And you yeah, spend less money doing it. Let, let me yeah. build up. The expectation is exactly, Michael, the expectation, this we should share. The expectation is that an innovation project get, get stopped after a no-go, yeah? And we also did the math around uh, that. So normal in a normal corporate environment, uh, uh, in Europe, in the US, an innovation project uh, has an average du uh, durability of at least, I would argue, two, probably more than three, or more like three years. Now do the math. If we are able, or, or if an organization is able to already stop numerous innovation ideas after two, three, four months, uh, imagine how much money, also opportunity costs, I admit, regarding personnel, of course, yeah, you can save to really concentrate on, on uh, innovation ventures which have more uh, potential to scale. That's the beauty of, the, uh, of this, of this uh, process, even if an organization does not find the unicorn. Although I have to say, 
the intention of doing that all is at the end of the day to have successful innovation projects. No question around that. It is a, a very good, nice uh, or side effect uh, to have a very cost efficient uh, and a, a way to, to sort out those ideas which have no potential to scale. Yeah, the, the only, uh, let's say, if I do take the devil advocate hat and put on my head is uh, if the risk is to waste money on uh, wasted or again, no go successful uh, innovation project, as is typically happens, probably the, the most uh, cost efficient approach is to not innovate at all. That is actually something that most corporates are doing, do not innovate. Yeah, but then uh, we know the results, right? If an innovation project, or if, uh, sorry, if organizations don't uh, stop uh, innovating, well, then they just have to wait until they're attacked in their existing core business. And we are seeing that more and more. And uh, uh, also, as human beings, uh, also more and more organizations, unfortunately, are dying. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, or they just fade away uh, unless, until they are not relevant any longer in the market. They're just niche left yeah, or a niche left and and therefore so the alternative uh, to not start innovating i would say is not a good uh, is not a good uh, alternative for those who believe or the senior managers they, that they want to be successful for the future success of the company i mean particularly in europe right where you claim um, i said that strongly that you care about the social aspects of a business so if you're not innovating that's actually socially irresponsible as a company, right? You're almost condemning yourself to fading away, slowly withering away, slowly having to cut away all of your workers. Where are you going to send them? No, again, guys, yeah. I'm totally with you. I'm just, uh, since I'm I'm on uh, on the street every day, trying to <laughs> convince a corporate that have to innovate mm -hmm. if they don't want to die. On the other hand, uh, it's difficult uh, to let them digest the truth that are these numbers, because these numbers from corporate are not particularly forward looking, are so difficult to be eaten and uh, digested that most of the time, they, on the one hand, they stop any planning. On the other hand, uh, in order to make them more palatable, they are changing the KPIs in a way that at the end create frustration. So that is the, the situation that most of the time we are in. Again, with forward-looking company, these conversations are easy to be done, while in the majority of situations, uh, I believe that are difficult. And again, that is the, the struggle that we are uh, fighting every day. And uh, that's, I think, I really love this conversation with two, you guys, because I think there is a lot of learning and this learning share with also with the others, I hope it will help others to follow your suit and initiate uh, open innovation activities that are that have a realistic expectation that are properly done. So that's our goal. And uh, that's why a contribution like yours is so valuable. And really want to, to thank you for, for the time and thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you for having us. Yeah, same. Thanks a lot, Alberto. It was a pleasure. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.